Well, my name's Josh Baker. I take pictures. Um, hi, Josh. And that was a re- that was the response that was supposed to happen. Um, so yeah, I I I don't know what y'all all know me for, but um, I'm a fresh photographer. That's all I do. I take pictures for a living. Um, and some of what we do is architecture. I was just in Lagrange last week uh, shooting a commercial building. Uh, I don't really shoot real estate, but um, I shoot more for like builders, home builders, construction builders, um, architects, um, a granite company. We shoot for a high-end granite company. So it's more of, I try to look at it more from artistic uh, standpoint than, oh, y'all can't see my screen. <laughs> Let's go to share screen. Screen one, share. Can everybody see, it says lens, light, and location? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. see it. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I, um, uh, hold on. I'm trying to make this bigger. I can't see all y'all. Um, anyway, so yeah, commercial photographer, I do buildings and, and I like, I like art. Um, and I like buildings and I love the lines and shape that they create. So, um, what I want to talk about today is kind of the history of architect photography. Cause I think it's very it's underappreciated the role that architecture photography had in accepting photography as an art form. Um, is that Ginther over there? What's up, big man? How you doing? I'm good. Awesome. Good to see you. Good to see you. Ah, I can see everybody good. Figured it out. Okay. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to talk about four of the kind of big names um, at the beginning of architecture photography and kind of where we started. I'm going to talk about some of the people that are currently practicing in it now. Um, and then we're going to talk through gear and kind of some ideas on how to do it for yourself. Does that sound good? Yay. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay, good. All right. So if you want to follow along with me, um, on Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Azulocks. Um, if you follow me on YouTube, I would love it. I'm trying to build up my followers there, but, um, we do, uh, two, uh, live streams a month. And one of them is called learn Lightroom live, where I talk about different, uh, Lightroom techniques. Um, so I may be doing one on architecture next month cause I just shot a bunch of it. So that may be next month. Um, so if you want to see me process a photo and post, that'd be where you go. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So this Can is actually we one see of my- your slide view. Do you not see it? We see all your. Uh, oh, you want me to hit present? Yeah, here, hold on. Better? Is that better? Yeah. Better. better. Okay. okay, okay, cool. Um, it's 27, it's 30 inches on mine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I forget everybody's on Zoom. Um, so this is actually one of my photos at um, uh, not uh, Sea Home District. So right there, like down on the waterfront, the old power plant. Um, and I think this is a great example of kind of what we're talking about today, which is two, two things that you should keep in your head is straight lines and crooked light. Um, throughout all the photos that I've studied of architecture photography, um, one thing kind of stands out, which is get your line straight and get your light crooked. Yeah, that kind of makes sense as a way to distill that down. So I don't know, I just love the little pocket of light there in the center. Okay, so let's talk about some interesting things. Um, does anybody know what this photo is and where it is? Clay? Uh, it's the French photographer uh, who looked out his window and it's with the, I'm not sure, it's a plate, right? It's the first developed picture that survived. Mm-hmm. Does anybody know currently where this photo is in the world? Is it over at the Ransom Center? It's at the Ransom Center. So what's fascinating to me is we're talking about architecture photography. The first surviving photograph is of a building, and it's in Austin, Texas. I don't know. I just find that kind of interesting. So little, little tidbit. Now the exposure was like eight hours. <laughs> the ISO was like half <laughs> of one. Um, yeah. Anyway, but I just think that's a little interesting trivia. Um, so... I think in any genre of photography that you're interested in nature, wildlife, you know, portraiture, weddings, whatever. Um, I think it's a great practice to study 
the people that do it really well and what are their techniques? How do they do it? What's their inspiration? Um, what was the vibe they were trying to do it? What, what environment did they work in? Right. I think those are all things to help yourself get to where you want to go with whatever photography you like. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of why we want to study the masters of whatever we're doing. But I think that photography and architecture have a lot in common. I think architects and photographers both have boundless imaginations, but we work in the real world and we have to be constrained by budget, time and material, right? I have lots of ideas for photos. I only have so much time to make them happen. I only have so much budget to make them happen. Um, and I only have so much gear to make them happen, right? So as an architect, right, it's empty space until they do something with it. Um, and their, their imagination is only constrained by how much money you're willing to give them, right? How much time you're willing to give them and how many materials you're willing to give them, right? Pyramids of Giza, they weren't built in a week, right? <laughs> um, you know, the, the Notre Dame Cathedral, I mean, how long did that thing get take, take to build? 100 years or so? Um, and so I just find it interesting that there's a lot of similar thought processes from architects and photographers. And there's this relationship that goes back and forth with them. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so the four people that I want to talk about, they're kind of the, they're maybe not the, I think they're the most well-known, but you know, there's others obviously out there. These aren't the only four that ever did it. Uh, but I just, I picked them for a variety of reasons. So one is Lucien Hervé. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, very abstract. Um, the first to really shoot details. Um, he really shot for like book and magazine layouts. We'll talk more. Um, probably the most famous is Julius Schulman. Um, at the end of this presentation, there's a link, um, he, there's a documentary about his work on Amazon called Visual Acoustics, uh, Visual Acoustic or something like that. Um, he was prolific, prolific. They, he was shooting like a thousand jobs a year. Yeah. Uh, and you've seen his work in uh, pop media. Um, and you may not have even realized that you've seen his work, but his, his photos really were that Southern California cool that got exported in the sixties. We'll talk more. Um, opposite of Shulman was Karab, Balthazar Karab. Um, Stark, very like he worked in the Midwest. So like Detroit, Cincinnati, Cleveland. And his work is very like imposing and cold and very different. Um, and then there's Ezra uh, Stoller. Uh, he actually had a verb like people, architects said that the building wasn't photographed until it was stolarized. Um, and he just had a way of like, just a bunch of energy in his photos. So we'll see more about him. All right. So I am fascinated by this photo. This is uh, Lucien Hervé. Um, and this is from the high court in Chandigarh. Now, here's something interesting about this place. It, it started, it, it was planned in the 30s. Um, as a master, a new master plan city. Um, and the plans were for it to be like a quarter million people. Um, and so it got, um, there was a huge competition to who, who got to design this city. Um, and the guy that got to design it, I'll, there's another slide with his name, but I, I, I'm blanking on his name, but huge name in French architecture. Um, and and Chandigar is amazing because all of these photographers end up going there and putting their own spin on these buildings. So for architecture photographers, it's kind of like, you know, the Grand Canyon or, you know, the Tetons for a landscape photographer, right? It's a place that you have to go and put your stamp on the photos, right? Shandagar to Hervé is like Ansel Adams to Yosemite. Okay. And everybody then kind of goes back and puts their own spin on Yosemite based on what Adams did. Does that make sense? but it, it becomes a touchstone place uh, that they go back and forth on. Um, I still can't exactly figure out what's going on in this photo and I love it, uh, but it is completely random and abstract. And he did not shoot the entirety of the building. He shot just this abstract and kind of one of the first ones to take it from informational to artistic. Um, and so I love, I love this type of, of, work. Um, it's very, very amazing. Shooting on eight by 10 film cameras, by the way. Um, here's another one from 
uh, same same city, uh, but a different building. Um, and I just love this repeating line of triangles. Um, and again, it's not it's not shot as a super wide, right? We think architecture, we think wide, but it's not. It's this very tight, uh, very linear. But look at the look at the interplay of all the triangles that's going on there, and this almost spiral effect with the highlights and shadows. Now, again, they're shooting with right eight by ten film, um, generally, and I always wonder things like, how long did he sit there and wait for the light to do that? Because he was there like over the course of like a year or two documenting this, and just having that time to document those places and find those angles and do that sort of thing. And so that's kind of what I talked about in the first slide. You know, we have these unlimited imaginations, but we're constrained by time, budget materials, right? Um, so, so Hooray is interesting. Um, he actually went to school with uh, Piet Mondrian um, and he started, he wanted to be a painter at first. Um, and then he got into murals and like collages. And when somebody asked him how he became a photographer, uh, he said, uh, because of a pair of scissors. Um, I don't know, interesting person. Um, he ended up working with the architect, Corbassier. God, I cannot think of the guy's name. So Corbassier is the one who ended up designing Chan de Gras. Um, Corbassier is a very famous uh, architect. Um, and then Hervé actually went to work for his firm later. So there was some crossover. Um, he actually went to help like design aesthetics and stuff. So he started as a photographer, ended up working in an architect's office. All right, but look at this. Like this is just, Oh, it's so amazing, right? How long did he wait for that guy to walk through that negative space? Like, I just find this fascinating. I love the way they played with the shadows and highlights and midtones and just got it, right? Um, I love this photo. But again, it's it's this one place, right? Um, and so because of Hervé, Shandagar becomes this touch point. So, all right. Who knows what this house is, right? Raise your hand if you've seen this photo before. No? I'm surprised not everybody's raising their hands. Yeah. So <laughs> this is case study house number 22. Um, there were actually 30 case study houses. So this was, this house is really the founding of suburban America. Um, the case study houses were built in Southern California around LA. And it was about a new type of home and a new type of neighborhood. And these were the model homes um, that were going up. And so these were the ideas that were coming out from these different architects. So it was a big deal to get to design one. Um, and this, this photo is maybe the most famous architectural photography photo ever taken. Um, it's been in pop media, it's been recreated. Um, it's just a, a massive, uh, massive uh, cultural icon. Uh, I, I want to say this exposure was eight minutes. Um, and then the flash fired at the end to get the people inside, you can see the flash, he hit it with that center column there. Uh, but he talked about this photo that he wanted to show this photo in relation to LA's lights at night. Okay. And so he had to expose and let those lights come in again. They're shooting eight by 10 format. ISO is like nothing. And so he had to let that shutter stay open to let those lights soak in and then big flash tube at the end. Okay. If you go to this house now, uh, it's kind of what Bill was talking about earlier. There's actually signs on the ground and in the pool from where he put his tripod, but it says Shulman's tripod was here. That's how like, big this was. So Shulman had four T's of architectural photography, which was transcend, transfigure, translate, and transform. Um, and he, he felt that that was his job was to, um, you know, translate what the building was into this aesthetic. Um, and his aesthetic was absolutely Southern California and the, you know, how cool and hip and young and exciting it was. Um, this was a time when LA was experiencing rapid growth. Uh, media was experiencing rapid growth. And so all these magazines were calling him, right? Better Homes and Garden and Good Housekeeping. And they were giving him assignments all over the place to go shoot these different houses. And then that culture got exported to the rest of the world. Um, and so he was just a prodigious, like a thousand to 2000 assignments a year. Crazy, crazy. And he shot, he shot into his nineties. 
So see, Mark, as a photographer, there is no retirement. We just keep shooting until we die. So like, this is the case study house in the Simpsons, right? Like it, it made the Simpsons. Okay. So right, right here in this, in the pool steps, right there in the steps, there's a marker for where he put his tripod to make this shot. Okay. Cause his tripod was in the water. Um, but he also, uh, this is another famous one as well, but this Palm Springs in 47. So think about who was in Palm Springs in like the late forties, early fifties, right? These houses against nature, right? People in New York didn't have this, right? People in the Midwest didn't have this view. Um, and so this was very much what he recreated um, and translated and transformed. Um, you know, that, that slow movement in the water, that warmth of the, of the windows against the cool shadows of the mountains. But again, straight lines, crooked light, right? His lines are vertical. That light's kind of coming in off the side. Okay, but Palm Springs, right? This kind of area, the Southern California, right? Case study house number 20, right? Case study house 20, um, another one, right? I mean, it's got a vintage Porsche. It's got cubist lines and a little like waiting pool off to the right. Like how freaking cool is this house? Um, but again, straight lines, crooked light. We have the warmth inside, the cool outside. We have that good contrast going on. Um, just amazing work. This photo has been redone a bunch too. Okay. Case study house 21, right? There's a whole bunch of these. Um, so actually, uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie did a recreation of this photo for Vanity Fair. So just talking again about how he was exporting that cool and then people wanted to emulate it you know, even 50 years later, it's still well known enough that you have two of the biggest movie stars in the world recreating this photo. Okay. That, that elevated architecture photography. All right. So here's Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, same house. Okay. Shulman gets recreated and talked about a lot. If there's one to study, it's probably him. <laughs> this is my favorite photo of him working. <laughs> he was shooting all these post, you know, World War II boom towns, right? LA being the biggest example. But the houses were going up so fast, they didn't have trees. Well, he would carry a branch with them and then just build a little set and then shoot through those branches to make it look like the trees had already grown up, <laughs> right? To give it that greenery, all right? So he, he built himself a little forest to shoot through. So look at that camera, huh? Who wants to work with that one? Awesome, right? Perfect for selfies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that camera on a selfie stick, you better be a bodybuilder, man. That thing's like 30 pounds. Um, but I just love, right? It, he wasn't taking photos, right? He was making photos. Yeah, right. He brought those plants in <laughs> for that specific job of framing the house. Okay. But again, that, 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 uh, that suburban sprawl, right? This is the beginning of all this. Okay. All right. Now, Contrast that cool California with this guy, Balthazar Karab. Stark, austere, right? That Midwestern cold, right? Look at how this photo, this building feels like it's about to crush the guy in the stairwell. Can y'all feel that? The building's about to be like, <laughs> like hole punch him, you know? Um, just a very different feel, okay? It's, there's nothing wrong with it. I love, I love this photo. I love the use of the shadow against the white light. I think it's great, but just, it's a very different feel. Um, his sons are actually still carrying on this business. So Karab image is still in business today. And they, they you know, they started shooting in the sixties um, and they're still predominantly in the Midwest, but his sons, uh, both are also ended up going to work for an architecture company later. He started as a photographer, ended up working in architecture. So this is also a huge um, building that gets photographed frequently, right? The TWA lobby at JFK in New York. Um, but look at Karab, it's stark black, bright whites, one solitary person. For a lot of his stuff, that may be him in the photo, I don't know, but there's just one, usually one solitary figure in it. Um, but very cold, very, very clean, but just very different, 
I try to internalize this because we're going to see another example of the same photo shot by somebody else. Stoller does a much different photo in almost the same place. Um, but just what a cool like that, like 60s, like almost like retro future vibe. I love it. Again, right. <laughs> um, one solitary person eating an ice cream. Um, but look at these repeating lines. And then the repeating lines, that pattern is interrupted by that, that, that pillar right there. So this is actually somebody walking into, there was a school that he was shooting. This is a student walking into school. But again, one solitary person. Also look at our lines though, vertical, 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 horizontal light coming in from one side. And then one solitary person framed in all that negative space to show the scale of what we're seeing. Okay. All right, Stolarize. So this is, he was the one who shot the Guggenheim before the Guggenheim opened. If that gives you an idea of like what level he was at. Um, yeah, his work is great. Go look up EzraStoller.com. It's fantastic. Um, so this is the Seagram building. Um, and this is a masterful photo. Masterful. Now, the Seagram building's interesting. There's a lot going on with the Seagram building. Um, the Seagram building is kind of the first skyscraper in the United States in the what they call the international style. Um, it's also one of the first uh, public private courtyards in New York. So um, the the opening scene of Breakfast at Tiffany's when they're running through, that's the Seagram building. OK, but it's the first it was a privately built, you know, plaza that the public could use. Right. It wasn't a city park. It was, it's a private property, but it was open to the public. So Seagram Building has this very interesting history to it. I'd recommend reading up on this. If you like this stuff, it's very interesting. Um, and the guy that designed it, right, Mears van der Rohe, kind of famous as well. Um, but this is what you would call single point photography. Right. So everything ends up coming to that one point at the desk. So look at the symmetry. Right. We have an inter ex internal frame with an internal frame with an internal frame with a desk. And everything is perfectly symmetrical and all the lines point to that desk. Your eyes can't do anything but look exactly at that desk. Nothing in this photo allows you to go anywhere other than that. Okay. So if, some, if a client ever asks you for single point photography, this is that. Okay. All the lines converge to the center of the photo. Can you see that? Yeah. I love this photo. This is a beautiful, just feel those like warm tones. You can almost feel that warmth coming in. Everything's very soft. It's beautiful. Now, <laughs> Stoller, this is not a Karab photo, right? This is a Stoller photo. Look how many people are in it. Look at the light streaming through this building. Feel how much more energy this lobby has versus the one solitary figure of Karab, right? Not to say one's right or one's wrong, but I tend to like Stoller's work better. That's just me. But this TWA lobby becomes another place that a lot of them go back to shoot, right? Kind of that like, like Jetsons modern vision of America in the 60s, right? That kind of feel. Yeah. All right. So it's interesting, right? A lot of the, the people that are currently doing it, um, I think they follow some of the, I think there's some direct correlation. Um, Iwan Bon uh, works with Zaha Hadid. You remember the Beijing Olympus, the, the Crow's Nest Notatorium? You remember that building? So Zaha Hadid did that one among other like huge projects, um, but works with her a lot. Uh, Mike, Kelly, Mike Kelly on F-Stoppers, he does really great. He has some really great tutorials. Um, I've certainly learned a bunch from him. Um, he's kind of more of that Schulman mode. Uh, they have a very... Um, a current, another current one is Helene Benet. I hope I'm saying that right. She still shoots on eight by 10 film, black and white cameras, but very much her vey, like abstract, just crazy shapes. Um, and then Boz Prisnan, um, interesting. We'll, we'll talk, we'll see. So I love this photo of, uh, Awan Bon. Um, right now we have, now we have some good boys in the photo there. Um, this is an opera house, I think in Denmark. Um, and it just, it's, it's warm, even though it's cold, it still has that warmth to it, uh, but it shows a building in its relation to nature um, or to the environment, more to say. It shows the buildings in, in relation to the environment around it. Um, I love this photo. I think this one's beautiful. Um, you know, just a lot of energy. Um, I, I just love that photo. 
Um, but then interestingly, he also went to Chandigarh. This is 60 years later after Hervé was there. And these buildings for what they were designed for, they're no longer being used for, right? So this is supposed to be like the high court building. It is no longer the high court. So some of what Bond does is go and show how people are using buildings in ways that they were never designed for with a focus on third world countries and how people just live wherever they can live. So I think this is at the time that this, this building was built, it was literally the biggest architecture competition in the world. Um, and people competed to win the prize of getting to build it. And now six years later, you know, they're hanging laundry inside of it. And so just that dialogue of, you know, what are we really doing? How do buildings change? How do our needs change? Um, I think it's very fascinating. Bond does a lot of like kind of in your face, like, no, look at this. Um, you should, you should be paying attention because, you know, this was the height of ideals and now look where we are. Um, yeah. And, and this is Mike Kelly. I think this is very much in that Shulman um, motion. He shoots a lot in Southern California. Uh, some people know Mike Kelly. He did a, a LAX with like 150 planes uh, composed in one shot where he layered all the planes taking off from LAX in one, in one day. That's kind of a famous photo of his. Um, but definitely kind of that, that SoCal vibe. Um, again, right. This is that Palm Springs area. Look at the warmth coming out of the house against the cool California sky. Um, just that very much warm, 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 cool. Okay. Um, but very much Shulman style again, straight lines, crooked light. Um, he kind of, this is another great single point example, right? All of your lines converge to that single table, right? All of our lines are coming into the center, the roof, the wall, the wall, all coming in. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what this is. I I'm sure it's a building. I, I, don't, I don't know what building this is. I don't know what this photo is. It's beautiful though. I love it. So this is Helene Benet. I really think she's the spiritual descendant of Hervé. Um, uh, she actually went to school with Zaha Hadid. Um, Zaha Hadid is one of the biggest architects in the world right now. Um, and they're friends. So that helps, I guess. Um, again, went back and revisited Ch uh, Chandigarh. Um, and this is the floor there and just the way the light is coming across. But this is the photo I love. Just this like abstract art deco photo. I, I don't know where this is and I love it anyway. It's just an amazing display of tonality and lines. Um, her work is very interesting. Still shooting on an eight by 10 film camera. And then Boz Prisden, um, trained as an architect and really tries to ask the question, why does the building exist? Does it have a right to exist? Modern questions. Um, does a lot of work in the Middle East. Um, this photo, it just feels like an alien dropped this building there. Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm still not sure what this building is, but like, it feels from out of this world, right? It's all these like yellow tones and blue tones and this black monolith just bleh. Um, but does it really work to get rid of buildings around them? Doesn't really work to, he really show, tries to show all the other buildings around it, but in an interesting way. I, I, this photo's crazy. I have no idea what this is, um, but I love it. All right. So um, I'm going to look at this screen now. Um, are there questions? Are there questions so far? No questions? None? Not at all? I don't know. Am I talking too fast? No. Not for okay. me. Not okay. talking too fast. I was just wondering how you got so deep into architecture. Because um, I have to shoot it. And so um, people pay me to shoot it, so I better know what the hell I'm doing. I, <laughs> I don't know if you know this about me, Bill, but I can't do anything normally. Um, I can't just run a 5k. I have to run marathons. Um, it's actually, I actually, honestly, I have to be very careful about what I do because I can't do it lightly. I can do 0% or a hundred percent. Um, and so I went up, I did a pretty big deep dive on architecture photography. Um, cause I was having, I for a while, I had a, quite a lot of clients that I was doing this for, 
And so I wanted to make sure that I could talk about it with architects and builders and construction science people. Um, but I think architecture photography is different in that, right? There's this question of like form versus function, um, you know, for buildings, but also for photos, right? Is a photo supposed to be informational or is it supposed to be emotional? Right. That, that same question gets asked of buildings, right? Is this supposed to be a practical building or is it supposed to be a fun building? Right. Is it supposed to be, you know, we're building a courthouse. Is it allowed to just be a courthouse or does it need to be something more? Um, and I think that's a fascinating question. Um, I know there are people that were like, oh, it's taxpayer money. You know, we could, it should just be a metal, metal building and run, run the AC at 78. Um, but I think that's such a short-sighted, right? That building has to take up space. So if we can make it elevated, I think we should. Because we have to drive past it every day. So wouldn't it be cool if it was more fun? Like, aren't there houses you drive by and you're like, you get excited by it? There's one over on Enfield on like Mopac and Enfield. And they had like polka dot grass for a while and all these colors and right. For me too, like I lived in Mexico for a summer and just all the color of every house was just wild, right? Pinks and greens and reds and yellows. And I came back to suburbia Pflugerville and I'm like, it's kind of boring. <laughs> so I think buildings and space, right? We exist in space. And so being able to photograph the things that excite us about the people who do things with that space. I don't know. To me, it's kind of a cool thing. That was a, maybe a long way to answer that question. But a very good answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love architecture photography. I, I really, really enjoy it. I think it's, it allows me to slow down in ways that I don't with most of my other types of photography. But I, when I shoot buildings, I, I shoot much, much slower. It's the only time I bring out a tripod generally, unless I'm shooting the stars. That's the only time. Otherwise, I hate tripods. So any other questions so far? Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to start talking about how to make how to do this for yourself. You're, you're muted, Clay, if you're trying to talk to me. I see your lips moving. OK, so I was asking, uh, you have any comments about uh, color versus black and white? Seems like many of the pictures here we saw were black and white that was historical maybe now it's more common to do color it's certainly more common to do color now um i think it comes down to a couple questions right are you doing this work for a client um, or are you doing it for an artistic purpose um if it's for an artistic purpose there's no rules do whatever you want whatever whatever moves you if you want to explore you know just the tonality of a building i would suggest black and white um, but whatever, whatever moves you do now, if it's for a client, they probably have expectations They they're probably hiring you to put photos onto their website so they can show off, um, their work. And they probably want that in color. Probably like 99%. Maybe even, sure. uh, high def, uh, HD. Yeah. HDR. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Cause there's, there's a couple ways to accomplish that. What you're asking. Um, there's three, three ways to accomplish it. Okay. So really we, we have three, Oh, sorry. Were there any other questions so far? No, I'm trying to look at all the, everybody's little thumbnail. Okay. Um, so really we have um, three tools at our disposal, right? We have our lenses, we have our location and we have our light. Now, when I say location, I don't, if you're shooting a building, you're obviously on location. I don't mean that. I, I literally mean, is your camera on the ground? Is it elevated? Is it from another building? Um, for a while in the 20s, it was considered bad form if you shot from the ground. Right? If you were on the street level shooting a building, that was considered like common. It wasn't, it wasn't very you wouldn't do it. it. It's interesting how it's changed. Um, right. And the other thing too, like drones have really changed it as well. Right. It, it was impossible to get a overhead shot of most buildings unless you rented a helicopter or a plane. And at the shutter speeds they were shooting, you probably couldn't do it at all. So drone photography has really changed what you can do 
from like the top of the building. And the fact that we fly much more now than we ever have, we're viewing buildings from above in ways that we never did before, right? In the 1900s, 1800s, you certainly never saw a building from above unless you were looking down on it from a, a much taller building. Um, and so tools have changed, um, but also our culture has changed, right? We fly, right? We have drones, we have helicopters, we have all kinds of stuff now that we didn't have even 100 years ago, which was only in the 1921, right? That's not that long ago. Um, so yeah, again, we're just constrained by time, budget, and materials. All right, so generally for me, um, this is the federal courthouse. This parking garage is actually my favorite parking garage to shoot in in Austin. It's at uh, 4th and San Antonio. I love this building. I, I love this. This courthouse is beautiful. The way it re reacts to light is amazing. Um, and I love shooting in this parking garage. I shoot there all the time. It's great. Um, I would say for Lynn's choice, um, I think more like portraits uh, for, for architecture, right? This isn't real estate. For architecture, more like a portrait, right? Maybe 35 is probably as wide as I would go um, up to maybe like a 135, kind of that classic portraiture range. Um, if you're shooting at weird angles, right? Tilt shift. Does everybody know what a tilt shift does? I know you do, Bill. You're the smart one. Um, so I'll explain real quick. So generally, uh, do I have a camera on me? I, hold on one second. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I do. Hold on. So generally when we're shooting, right, with a normal camera, the light is gathered through the lens and then the sensor is straight, straight on, right? So it's gathering light straight onto the sensor. You're not showing us the camera. Oh, you're not looking at me? Ha, 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 ha. I have two screens. Anyway, sorry, I didn't realize you didn't see me. Um, I see both. Um, anyway, uh, they're locked in, right? The, the light is gathered through the lens and it hits the sensor straight, okay? So your plane of focus is the, the shape of the sensor, right? The light just comes and hits the sensor. What a tilt shift does is screw all that up <laughs> and it changes the plane of focus as it bends and tilts and moves. So it's changing the shape of what's in focus. Um, but what it allows you to do is change perspective. Uh, has anybody seen like an eight by 10 camera and has those bellows and then you can move them and tilt them and move them around. That's what you were doing. You were literally moving the plane of focus instead of hitting that sensor squarely, you could hit it at different angles. Um, so that's what tilt shift does. Um, but for buildings that allows you to like, if you try to shoot a building from the ground pointed up, you're going to get distortion and the top of the building is going to get very small, right? It kind of looks wrong but with a tilt shift you can correct for that movement up and so it allows you to to change the perspective nikon actually calls them perspective control lenses instead of tilt shifts so, anyway um there's certainly a time to shoot ultra wide right interiors uh, that mike kelly single point that ezra sola uh, single point those are certainly more toward the ultra wide side maybe not ultra wide but more like 24 20 24 um and obviously the big question is what do you show? What don't you show? Um, right. When we shoot headshots, we know to shoot like head and shoulders. Right. But at some point we had to learn, like, don't crop people at their mm -hmm. eyes. Right. Don't crop people like at the scalp. And I think with food photography and I think with buildings, that's kind of the hard learning point is like, what do I show? What don't I show? Do I show everything? Do I show a detail? Like, where do I stop my frame? Um, so that's something to practice is like, showing less than the full building, picking up details. I think the materials are so important. One of the reasons I have a builder client that loves me is that I showed the relation between two sets of materials that they use. Maybe they have a metal finish into a brick or into a stone. And I like getting interesting photos of how those, that stone and, you know, metal re talk to each other. How does the light hit those differently? So when we shoot close, like with a macro or something close, we can show detail. When we shoot wide, it's more environment. And so picking your focal length is, do you want to show everything? And in a sense, you're really not showing anything. Or do you show very little and suggest a lot? That's kind of the big question. Um, 
so this is this is from that same parking garage this photo is uh but i love the way the light just is hitting this building it's it's finished now and this was i think i bill i think you were with me on this adventure i think you were there you might have been um some other things that are good um a good tripod will make your life much better um i have a tripod i actually like now i haven't had a tripod i liked in a few years um i kind of go through them but i have a i have a binro that i really like right now um a gray card and color checker i know i harp on this all the time um but profile your monitors and profile your cameras um if you're shooting for a builder and they use a specific color of paint your photo should show that color of paint there you go bill's holding it up and i have a somewhere underneath my desk i have a color checker for my monitor right but if right if you're shooting for an interior designer and they picked out certain fabrics and colors your photos should be those colors the only way to ensure that is if your camera's profiled and if your monitor's profiled. I know I talk about it a lot. Um, Lightroom Photoshop, also good to have. Oh, or remote release, especially if you're doing bracketing, you don't want to touch your camera. So something where you can remotely, your hands are off the camera to trigger it. I just got a like an $8 Amazon remote cabled release. I use that a bunch. That's a good, good way. Okay, so we kind of have three choices for how to light we can do ambient only we could light with ambient plus an additional continuous light source we could do ambient plus strobe right pulse light uh, we could do all strobe um those are kind of your choices probably not all strobe um and for me i like to light for the face of whatever i'm shooting so i'm a portrait photographer by trade so i like to think of things in faces it just works well for me so I try to light like a portrait, but on a massive scale. Uh, this photo is a good example of showing up early for a shoot. I had to be at the convention center at 8 a.m. I got there at 7 a.m. I had this cool haze off Town Lake in December. And I love this photo. Anyway, crooked light, straight lines. All right. But by, what I mean by location is, are you low? Are you high? Are you... You know, are you wide? Are you tight? Where physically are you putting your camera? Are you shooting from the street? Are you shooting from a ladder? Are you shooting from a building across the street? How do you get access to that building? How do you get a permit to shoot from there? Are you shooting with a drone? Do you, are you licensed, right? There's all those things. Where am I physically putting the camera to shoot this building, all right? It's not just four feet on a tripod. That may be where you shoot, but I want you to think about going high, going low, going wide, going tight, and picking any two of those and figuring something out, okay? So you can pick from one of high or low and one of wide or tight, right? So you have four options, pick one, okay? There you go. Hmm. No, I don't really wanna talk about that too much. Okay. Let's talk about this basic st starting recipe. You know, honestly, something like a 24 to 105 is probably a great place to start. Uh, 24 to 70, great. Um, any of those or equivalent lenses is fine. Um, camera on a tripod, I would shoot bracketed. So something like, you know, minus two, zero, plus two, or minus three, zero, plus three. Um, and generally, you know, I want it sharp and a lot of focus. I'm probably going to be, you know, F8, F11, F16, somewhere in there, right? Our camera's on a tripod. Does my shutter speed really matter? Not really, right? It doesn't matter if it's 8,000th or 4,000th of a second. Not really. Um, now, if we want to go down slow enough to get like a walking person blurred, it matters then, but otherwise doesn't really matter. Um, and then low iso right so camera on a tripod base iso f8 f11 and then whatever shutter speed you get is whatever shutter speed you get doesn't really matter um now the way i frame especially inside a especially inside of an interior yeah um i keep my camera level with the floor so my camera's base plate should be parallel to the floor 
I don't want to tilt it up or tilt it down unless I'm using a tilt shift. Um, but I want to keep it straight because if I, once I start tilting up or down, I start getting that keystoning or I start getting the um, most opposite of keystone. What's the other one? Where it's heavy on top or heavy on the bottom? I can't remember. Anyway, but your vertical lines start becoming triangles. They're either inverted or regular triangles. So keep, can y'all see me at all? Or no, I don't know if you can see me. Let me, let me not share for a second. Uh, how do I stop sharing? Stop share. Okay. Can y'all see me there for a second? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we got you. Okay. What I'm trying to say is, oh, that's so getting flare from it. So I want to keep my camera flat. Okay. I want to keep it flat. I don't want to tilt it down. I don't want to tilt it up if I can help it. Um, and the, and the reason is if I tilt it up, my bottom pinches down. If I tilt down, I pinch up at the top. Right. And so my lines become right. They, they don't become straight anymore. They pinch and pinch. Okay. And that's also why I say don't shoot with an ultra wide. The an ultra wide lens honestly is the hardest lens to make a good composition with, um, because um, you have to include everything. <laughs> Whereas with it, like a fifty or an eighty five, you can pick what you want and you can ignore a lot, so you don't have to worry about if it's good or not. So I think starting out, shoot for the details and start start tight and then work your way wider. I think it's actually easier than starting wide. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say though? What was I just talking about before that? Vertical lines. Vertical lines. Yeah. Now, obviously, in you know Lightroom or Photoshop, you can correct for any skewed uh, lines if you want. Um, in Lightroom, there is the transform tool, um, and there is a guided, and you can draw your incorrect lines, and it'll straighten them. So you just trace your, your crooked lines, start from the outside, work your way in, but draw, you know, your, your outside, your far right line, draw the crooked, and then your far left line that's wrong, draw that one, and then it'll pinch everything straight up. Okay. Auto works pretty well. It's a lot better than it used to. Um, but generally, I'm either auto or guided. Uh, those are generally the two things. So that's under, in the develop module, there's a transform uh, menu on the far right and down um and there's you can hit auto and it'll try to make all your lines straight and if it doesn't work go to guided and it will um give you some tools to make those lines straighter so yes okay how are we feeling we feeling good all right let's let's talk about let's talk about the three big problems sorry three three solutions to the big problem you're going to have shooting a building Okay. I just used this analogy for the first time yesterday. I'm really proud of it. Okay. Here's the problem. Our human eyes are amazing. We can see something like, y'all are going to love this, 22 slices of bread. It's so stupid. Okay. So the human eye can see 22 slices of bread, right? So from the darkest dark to the brightest bright, the human eye can see 22. It's literally two to the 22nd. A lot of data. The best cameras on the market can do maybe 14 slices, right? Probably more like 13. That kind of lied to you a little bit, but somewhere in that range, 13 to 14 slices. So that's still eight or nine slices of information that the best cameras don't see, right? Have any of you tried to take a picture of somebody at sunset and you get either the person or the sunset, but not both? Our human eyes see it fine. The problem is the camera is limited. It can't see as many slices of bread. And so it has to pick either the highlights of the sunset or the midtones of the skin, but it can't do both. Okay. Right. If you're trying to shoot a building, right, you have an interior and you probably have a window. Do you want to see that window view? What do you do? Right. The building is giving you more slices than your camera can handle. Okay. So there's three ways to solve this problem. Okay. Three ways that I know of. Maybe there's more. There's three ways I want to tell you about, right? So the tried and true method is we're going to shoot a bracket. Lightroom's great at this now. They're off. 
The What's that? One is not responding. Serious. What? Oh, sorry. So you can shoot a bracket, right? Most cameras have auto exposure bracketing. Uh, so I tend to do something like minus four, minus one, plus two. I shoot Canon. That's just how they respond. It works well for me. And then in Lightroom, what I would do, I would click those three photos. I would right click, merge to HDR, and it's going to mash them all together into a new DNG file. It's actually just a giant TIFF in a DNG wrapper, but let's not get too technical. Um, and that's going to give you more slices of bread, right? So that's going to give you six extra slices, right? Because we're minus four, minus one, plus two. So that gives us six extra slices. The problem with that, yeah, they tint the windows. Um, they do. Um, the problem with that is that everything ends up looking kind of flat. Um, it there's too much data almost, but it's, it's certainly a way to do it. Okay. Very common, very fast. You don't need a lot of extra equipment. It has its uses. It absolutely has its uses with Lightroom being able to, to create a new DNG file and still then edit like you would a raw and still have that file flexibility. I think it's great. I use it a bunch. Okay. I think that's a great technique to learn how to do shoot a bracket smash them together in Lightroom with right click, photo merge, HDR, okay? The trick to that, I shoot an AV mode um, because I don't want my camera changing my aperture. I want it changing my shutter speed. If you're in manual mode, you can, you can just move your shutter, right? Six clicks, take a photo, six clicks, take a photo, six clicks, take a photo, you're good. Uh, but generally I'm in AV mode because I want to pick my aperture, auto exposure bracket, brrr, take three photos, good to go. Generally, something like minus four, minus one, plus two. Okay. So that's one way to do it. Second way to do it. This is the way I started. Um, bring lots of lights <laughs> and nuke that building. <laughs> um, yeah, you do not, you do, yeah, yeah, Vance, yeah, yeah. You don't want the depth of field changing. Yeah, same focus point. You don't want focus changing, and you certainly don't want your aperture changing. It'll give you a weird blend. Yeah. Good question. Um, um, whew, earbuds get hot. Um, second way to do it, right? You can bring in lighting. Um, that's what I used to do. I just tried to solve all my problems with like, remember uh, tool time from home improvement, more power. That used to be my method where I would just bring more lighting to everything. Um, giant soft boxes, big, powerful lights. I'd show up to a job with like, you know, 3000 watt seconds of flashes and just kill it. Um, and that's certainly a way. Um, it's a hard way to do it because you have to carry a lot of equipment. But there are certain projects where that is the answer. I show up to my shoots with all that gear now just in case I tend not to use it as much. Um, yeah. So another way to do it. Um, take an interior exposure, take an exterior exposure and then layer mask them in Photoshop. So that's what a lot of the high-end retouchers are doing now. Now, they may do an HDR as their interior exposure and then a separate HDR for their exterior exposure. And then they're going to blend those two exposures by layer masking out the windows. So they're going to they're going to go with the pen tool and trace the windows and then bring in that outside exposure with a layer mask. Does that make sense? I don't know if I have an example. Yeah. If you see like the, you know, a Miami condo where you can see all the interior data and then you can still see an ocean view with like a sunset, that's how they did it. Okay. It's not an HDR. They, they took a, a great exterior. It's probably not even a sky from that day. Um, but they take an exterior exposure, a great interior exposure. And then with the pin tool, they trace the outlines of the windows, create a layer mask, blend those two files. Okay. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Okay. Also useful for real estate photography. If you want to try to make money that way, I would recommend not trying to make money with real estate photography. It is not fun. Ask me how I know. Uh, okay. Where am I in my presentation? But that's how you solve that problem. Mm. 
I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. Why do, um, for interior real estate photos, why do they seem to tint the photos? They don't seem to use natural colors. They look kind of orangish. Uh, because that is a bad HDR merge. So it used to be you could only do HDRs with JPEGs, um, and they came out really noisy and really vibrant uh, to the point of like oversaturating their color channels. So a lot of them, the other part that nobody wants to talk about is a lot of people are shooting on auto white balance, um, which you shouldn't do. <laughs> so my general rule for white balance is shoot, our cameras have presets. So whatever is the most dominant light source in the room, pick that preset. And I'll explain why for in a second. But right, so if we're shooting at night and all the lights are tungsten in the house, right? Even if we have a couple fluorescent lights, the ones that are contributing the most to your exposure, pick tungsten, right? We're shooting at noon and we have big bay windows. Even though the light bulbs are on, the volume of light coming in from those windows is daylight. So I would be on daylight preset. The reason I say that, imagine that you were shooting a kitchen that had cherry cabinets, right? Red, that red stain. Your auto white balance is going to see that red color and go, oop, too much red, let's add green. Vice versa, if you had a lot of foliage in your room, the camera sees all the green, it's going to go, oh, that's too much green. I want to be in the middle. Let's add red to neutralize. Well, if you're doing a view to the left and a view to the right, and you have a plant to your left and red cabinets to the right, those two photos, if you're on auto white balance, are going to look like they're not even the same house because one had a bunch of red added and one had a bunch of green added, even though your lights were tungsten. Okay. So if you're in a room, if you're in a space, pick your white balance preset for whatever the most dominant light source is. Um, I would recommend that over shooting auto white balance generally i'm i'm generally in kelvin i'm i'm a lighting nerd though but i'm generally in kelvin i don't like my presets so if i'm using my flashes i'm generally at 4800 kelvin um if i'm shooting the night sky i'm generally at 3300 kelvin um, and I'm, I'm actually in kelvin i don't actually use a preset because i'm a nerd I'm also really bothered by light colors. Like in the precision classroom, they have fluorescent and tungsten on those side walls. And if anybody's ever taken a class with me, the first thing I do in the classroom is turn those lights off because they literally give me headaches because I hate watching like tungsten and fluorescent light at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. What other questions? Fire me. Everybody take, it, take yourself on moot. Throw out your questions. This is your chance. Talk architectural. Light, is um, that light balance shouldn't matter if you're shooting raw, though, right? That's what I heard. I mean, yes and no. Here's here's why it does matter. It doesn't, but it does. Let me explain why. Especially with shooting, if there's a human in it. Especially if there's a human. Humans' skin tones are red and oranges. And if you go from daylight to tungsten on a human portrait, you'll lose about a half a stop of light because you're diminishing the reds and oranges. So if you're trying to nail your exposures, I try to shoot and visualize um, with as accurate as a white balance as possible so that in camera, I can make any changes to the scene if I need to. So I'm gonna pick the most dominant light source. And that way, if there's a stray light bulb, that's the wrong color, I'm either gonna unscrew it or replace it with a, a proper one. Um, or I might be wrong on which one it is, and it'll be noticeable if I see it in camera. So I want to shoot as close as possible in camera, even though I'm shooting raw, um, because that's going to change my exposure values, especially in the reds and oranges, as I shift from daylight to tungsten. Does it, I mean, does it absolutely matter? Maybe not, but it, I think it makes my photos better if I'm closer at the beginning, especially if I'm using a flash, because if I'm using a flash, I want to be, Right, I might be gelling it to match an ambient color, and I want to make sure those match. And if I wasn't in the right white balance and camera, I might not be able to align those as well. Yeah. Good question. Somebody else was starting one. When you're shooting the kitchen example, wouldn't that be a good time to bring out your color checker and shoot a reference shot there? Mm -hmm. I color, yeah, I. I I mean, literally, I was, I shot a building Friday 
and in every room I went in, I, I, I took a frame with the color checker. Yeah. Cause it was like kind of tungsten, kind of fluorescent and I couldn't dial in my white balance. So I didn't, so I just, there's my arm in the frame with the color checker and every room that I went in. Yeah. Hey Josh. Yeah. You have to get permission to go into like do outside of some of these buildings or parking garages or whatever. Do people get <laughs> security, get upset and haul you off. <laughs> so I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a story by the way of, of, of informing you. So that federal courthouse, as long as you're on the public sidewalk, you can shoot wherever you want. Okay. If you step off that sidewalk <laughs> in about 30 seconds of that federal courthouse, you are going to have a federal police officer asking you for your memory card. Oh. Ask me how I know. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't me, but somebody, one of my students did, and it got contentious there for a second. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. So <laughs> there is what's generally called the right expectations of privacy. Um, if you show up to a public event, you don't have any expectation of privacy. Um, if you are shooting a building from a public sidewalk, shoot all you want. Once you get off that sidewalk onto private property, now you're on their rules. I'll tell you a funny story. Remember big boy that came through that big train? Oh yes. I, yeah. <laughs> I was shooting the train in front of my, my, my family has a, a railroad business. I grew up in the railroad industry. So I was shooting the train going in front of their building. There was 300 people, 400 people around me, maybe more. And from like 200 yards away, this lady came up to me. She was like, I need you to delete those photos. <gasps> I was like, no, I was on public property. I was like, no, not going to do it. Sorry. She goes, you have photos of my kids. I need you to delete them. Oh, I was like, I don't care about your kids. You're in a public place. I ain't deleting these photos. And she got real mad at me. And I didn't care a bit because I had one chance to get those photos in front of my, you know, there was big boy going in front of my dad's office. I was like, Her man, you have already been in the pictures. <laughs> they were like this big. You couldn't do anything, but she didn't know. But the point was, and I told her this was, ma'am, if you don't want photos of your kids, there are literally every person here has a camera. You picked me because mine's on a tripod. Are you going to go up to every single person and ask them to go delete photos because your ugly kids are in it? No. <laughs> so if you don't want photos of your kids, you know what you can do? Don't show up to public spaces. Buildings are the same way, right? If you want to build walls around your building on your property, you're more than welcome to do that. But if you don't have walls and you're on public space, we're going to take pictures of them just the way it is. Now, that being said, if you're using a super telephoto lens and you're shooting into windows, that's a little bit different, right? That's, that's not, if you're in your own home, you should have a reasonable expectation of privacy. You know, I'm behind a wall. You shouldn't be shooting into people's rooms, right? Um, but architecture photos from a sidewalk, go for it okay. from a parking garage, state parking garage. You're more than welcome to go shoot from it. Yeah. I've, I've at that one at that parking garage at fourth and San Antonio, I've never had a problem. The only problem I've had, and they were cool about it, but some nights there's a drive-in theater there. Um, and they just like, Hey, just make sure you're done before cars come in. Okay. So you went inside the parking garage and you were cool. They were fine. Oh yeah. I went all the way to the top. Oh. Yeah, oh, I, wow. shoot, I, I shoot up there like once a month. I love it up there. It's like a little oasis of downtown. You're surrounded on your, your, um, like all sides of the buildings. Van says trademark. Yeah. <laughs> and some buildings, like if you're shooting for stock, there are definitely some buildings that are recognizable enough that you can't submit them for stock because they have like copyrights or trademarks on them. Um, but for your own portfolio, you can shoot all you want. Yeah. And most of the stock companies, like they know which buildings can't, right? So, yeah. thank you. Yeah, good I question. got I got chased out of a parking tower just south of the river. Which one? The Hyatt one? No, uh, one on Mopac. It's a oh. state office, and the guard came out and talked to me about it. Yeah, security guards. Rent-a-cops are fun. Generally. Uh, 
Or was it a state police? Uh, I run a cop. Yeah, run a cop. Yeah, fuck uh, those guys. Something we might want to do as far as a speaker, particularly along this <clears throat> legal line, is Dave Wilson. Okay. is very informed if people are interested in where they can shoot and the legality of locations and how to deal with the folks dave would be a good speaker for the group yeah, that's interesting that's a good one put it in the notes um yeah i mean a, a lot of it comes down to reasonable expectation of privacy as long as you're not violating that you can shoot kind of whatever you want as long as you're on public space so and you're not commercial doesn't matter commercial or non-commercial doesn't matter there's photos i take i don't know if they're gonna at the time i'm shooting them i don't know if they're gonna be commercial or not some of the time how do you know i don't know if it's gonna be a photo at all now these rules are for the united states only a buddy of mine's in london and you have to get permits to shoot anywhere yeah what other questions y'all have how do you get the buildings to pose for you <laughs> that's a funny one because my joke is that's why I shoot porches because buildings and mountains never pose. Um, I mean, it's just like landscape, right? A lot of it is just patience and like waiting for good light and waiting for the right time. Like probably not shooting buildings at noon, right? We want crooked light. We want that side light coming in. We want our, our vertical lines to be straight and then the light to play off of that. Um, you know, I think architects design buildings to have light reflected off them. So it's up to us to capture them at different times to, to see that play of light. Um, I like morning shoots. There's usually less people. Um, usually people care less in the morning than they do in the afternoon after they've had a bad day. Um, so if you can, like that first light in the morning, I think is more interesting. Austin skyline is way better at sunrise than it is at sunset. Just the way the shape of the layout is, I, I way prefer sunrise for Austin skyline than I do sunset. You know, Josh, um, it's that way with nature photography, too, because late in the afternoon, you get distortion um, in waves. the air with the extra heat. Yeah. So it's much clearer. You get much better shots uh, in the uh, morning golden hour than you do in the afternoon. Yep. Yeah. Mm. What is my go-to tilt shift? Uh, generally 24 uh, for exterior. Um, I'm sorry, 17 for exterior, 24. No, I had it right the first time. 24 for exterior, 17 for interior. Yeah. That, the Canon 17 tilt shift is crazy. It has so much. It's, it's a crazy lens. If, if you've never shot with one, rent one sometime. Don't buy one. Don't You don't need to buy one. Um, but rent one from like lens rentals or something that's 17. The image circle is like, you could shoot. It's so big. They can shoot on medium format cameras. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, um, Canon is actually coming out supposedly with autofocus tilt shift lenses next year. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how that's going to work. That's beyond my understanding, but apparently it's coming. So Tilt shift is also used in product photography, right? If you're trying to shoot a can and you're up and you need to be in an elevated position, right? Normally that can's going to look like this. And so tilt shift allows you to change the plane of focus. So the can still looks straight up and down, even though you're at an elevated position. So a lot of product photography, high end product photography uses, that's why they have that like 90 tilt shift lens is to shoot products with. So they can be at an elevated position, but still make the can look like it's straight up and down even though they, it should be distorted. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Canon actually just came, sorry, I'm a Canon shooter, but they also just came out with the lens of tilt shift macros. So it's one-to-one -one macro tilt shifts. Crazy shit. Whole new world. <laughs> what other questions? Buildings, architecture, real estate, what, what do you got? I'm good right now, Josh. <laughs> I'm looking to see what tilt shift lens Nikon have. Their best one's the 24 for right now. I don't think they have a big, I don't think they have a 17. Maybe they do. Maybe they do now. They didn't for a while. 
most people I knew shot with a cannon tilt shifts, no matter what body they were on. Tilt shifts aren't that easy to learn. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. I rented one and it was a fail. <laughs> it don't do it drunk. It, you'll you'll lose your mind. <laughs> no tequila. <laughs> no. Has anybody shot with like a lens baby before? I know Mark had his out a little while ago. Has anybody mm -hmm. shot with a lens baby? So a lens baby is basically a it's it's a type of tilt shift lens because you're changing the plane of focus as the light hits the sensor, right? So you're you're making that light come in at a crooked position. That's how that's how a lens baby works. It's the same as a tilt shift. It oh. just doesn't have quite as many features, but it's it's essentially a tilt shift lens. Yeah. Yeah, tilt shift is not a fast process. You you are not shooting fast. <laughs> one degree up, one degree down, two degrees left, two degrees down. Yeah, very very new. That's why a good tripod matters because you're sitting there messing with it. You don't want to have your tripod tilting over or doing whatever. Cool. Anything else? Any other questions? So is the art photography? I mean the art architecture photography is still is it still a a um, fine art medium is it still uh, growing the way it was in the past mm, here's here's my basic stance on that never in the history of time has great imagery been as valuable as it is now nobody reads <laughs> We, we look at pictures to inform us all day. How many photos do you think you see a day? How many images do you think you see a day? 10,000? 20,000? All they, of them. Yeah, all of them, right? How many do you actually stop at? Two, three, maybe, out of those 10,000? You know what I mean? Like if you're scrolling like your Facebook, your Instagram feed, how many photos do you actually go like, whoa, what's going on here? Very few, right? So even though everybody in the world has a camera, everybody, right? Everybody's got a camera on the phone. We have cameras all around us, cameras everywhere. What can you do as a visual artist to make the person viewing that photo stop and look and give you some attention? Because that's what, that's what companies hire for. Companies hire you because you can create a photo or a mood or a vibe or an energy that nobody else can do. That's why I get hired. The toll road hires me because I can make sidewalks look pretty. I don't know. I can. I just can. Um, but I wasn't the first photographer they hired, but I'll probably be the last. So until I don't want to do it anymore. So I mean, I think that's the key, right? Like, can you create something visually interesting enough for people to stop and look? I mean, we, we see it too, right? Let, think, of, think about our photo competitions that we have. In every competition, we get really good photos. But generally, there's like one or two in each level where you're like, what the, f where, how did you do that? Right? Don't we get those from time to time? And you're just like, what? But, and like your brain short circuits, you got to look at it. And you're like, okay, okay, I see what's going on here. And so being able to create that with a building, that's a valuable skill. If you can do it with anything, it's a valuable skill. You can make money that way. Nobody's going to hire you to be a second rate, you know, Mike Kelly. But I guarantee you, Mike Kelly makes a damn good living shooting buildings. It, it's helped me. I mean, I, it's a substantial part of what I do. Most people don't know that. I don't really post a lot of that stuff, but I shoot a lot. Good question though, Clay. Anybody else? Anybody else got anything? Well, I do see on YouTube when you do a search for architectural photography, you do get a lot of, of YouTube videos. People are interested in knowing that as a skill. Think about it this way too, right? Think about how much architectural photography is a part of travel photography. So travel photography is really three components, food, portraits, landscape buildings right? Landscape or the buildings you go, right? 
if you if you travel to France and you go to Paris, what are you shooting? You're shooting the Eiffel Tower. You're shooting a mime and, you know, a French loaf, right? Or a glass of wine, right? I mean, you're shooting the food, you're shooting the people, you're shooting the buildings. Generally, that's what, that's what travel photography is. So getting good at architecture also makes you a better travel photographer. Yeah. Don't forget the Louvre. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's the pyramid in front, right? Or, or whatever, wherever you go, right? You know, it's funny. When we think of a town, we often think of their buildings, right? If, if I tell you, or structures, right? Three, you know, Austin, what? Frost Tower, 360 Bridge. State Capitol. Capitol Building. Ta yeah. uh, UT Tower. UT Tower, right? We, that becomes the icon iconography. Did I say that right? I iconography I of, of icon the city iconography right san francisco what's what's the buildings you think of san francisco pyramid the golden gate bridge mm -hmm. alcatraz alcatraz coit tower right but golden gate bridge probably is, you know you know there's that that bridge design it's all over the world there's one in portugal just like it there's like fisherman's wharf fisherman's I'm, wharf yeah exactly I'm uh the three sisters I'm a <laughs> the green red barn some of the churches, right? Like Emmanuel Lutheran, that old church. There's the old church in Huddle. There's the one in New Sweden, yes. right? The churches, right? Um, you know, so, I mean, as you travel, it, a lot of what you're shooting is the buildings. So if you can get good water at that. Tower. You, what's that? Oh, water, the blue. Yeah, water the blue. towers. Yeah, water towers. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, you know, if you want, if you like traveling, get good at architecture and your travel photos will be better because it's basically one third of what you're going to shoot. Yeah. Food and people are the other two things. Never thought about it that way, did you? Mm -mm. Uh, yeah. Also, architecture and skylines are kind of like landscapes for me. I I think cities are more interesting than mountains for for me. Um, and so I I like cityscapes more than landscapes. So I I love cityscapes. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, corporate annual reports. Yeah, that's what. That's one of the reasons I'm shooting for the toll road is their annual report. Yep. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Go subscribe to my YouTube channel. I, I'm almost at 200. I, I need to get to a thousand. So help me get there. Yay! Just search Azulox on YouTube. You'll find me. And it also helps you with Lightroom. I do live streams all the time. It's fun. So. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Um, get your images submitted. I'm going to go do that as soon as I click off this meeting uh, so that you can get into this competition because I forgot last month because I was traveling. I forgot. Um, Cody, good to see you, man. Thanks for showing up to the first meeting. Glad to have you. Um, everybody else, not so much. Thanks, Josh. Good job. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. All right. We'll see you. It was awesome. Well All done. Right. Enjoyed the slides. All right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.